Good afternoon, guys. Thanks for joining Sentinel Commercial for this webinar and the first of a series of webinars on managing corrosion in closed loop heating and cooling systems. Uh, this is going to be presented by myself, Jay Davey. I cover the central, no, central London region for Sentinel Commercial and my colleague, Craig Milner, who is our Northern Commercial Manager. If you've got any questions, can you please use the raise the hand symbol, which is at the top of your screen? Um, and can we ask that while we are presenting, could you just place your microphones on mute to eliminate any background noise? I'll pass it over to Greg. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, if we had the technology, we would put subtitles on the bottom because of my northern accent, but I can only apologise for that. Um, so, as Jay said, we're looking at managing corrosion in closed loop heating and cooling systems. Managing corrosion is the key part of it. Uh, there's always going to be corrosion levels. It's just actually minimising the corrosion levels and the impacts that they have on the system to give the longevity of life to a system. So it is managing. It's not eliminating corrosion. And Uh, Sentinel have been known uh, in water treatment for over 25 years. They've obviously done, been under previous names uh, on the commercial side before. Um, we've got both domestic and commercial divisions. M myself and Jay are part of the commercial side. Russ Wallace covers the South Coast and uh, David Webster covers the Midlands. So we're always there if anybody needs help on existing systems or advice on new systems. Um, we do physical devices such as CalGAR for lamp scale control and uh, our corrosion monitor, which we'll get into, as well as the water treatment chemicals in this uh, seminar. Reason we wanted to do um, something on corrosion at this time is obviously there's a new BG29, which is one of the uh, Bisria BG29 which is one of the guiding lights in how you should look after a system. So a commercial system, anything over 200 litres. Um, and the six editions recently been launched uh, earlier this year during the pandemic. Always a good time to launch uh, new uh, legislation. So 2020 version, uh, it includes cleaning uh, precautions for thin wall carbon steel pipes, closed loop pre-treatment cleaning, and then also a bit of information on the VD2035. Uh, we won't go into VD2035. Basically, that's more to do with demineralized water, pH balancing, and it's a German directive. And you've also got to deaerate the system effectively. What we're going to be looking at is chemicals and the standard word in, in the UK. And then the other part that's been covered in BG29 is corrosion monitoring. So uh, BG29 is for systems that have been up and running up to a certain length of time, three months, and then BG50 takes over after that point. Um, systems less than 200 litres, so domestic type systems, are covered under a different directive, which is BS7593. As it says there, uh, corrosion is degradation of metal. Um, it can cause uh, failures short term as well as long term. Obviously, it's more of a long term issue, but you can get certain systems, aluminium, that can fail quite quick if the uh, water analysis isn't correct. The big one is the water's acting as electrolyte and that's causing the environment for the metals to corrode. Sorry about that. In the UK, um, we have multiple metals in a system, and obviously, galvanic corrosion is a big cause of um, corrosion. So, when you have multiple metals, they all interact. So, you've got some that are cathodic, some are anodic, as you can see, see from the electrochemical table on the right hand side. So all these different metals in a system all react with each other 
and that's where you can uh, get your corrosion cells forming. Um, when you're looking at a system, if you've got pits and holes in the pipeworks, that's where the metals are anodic. So they're giving off and giving up part of themselves through the electrolyte, which is the water, and uh, locating near the cathodic site. And that's when you get the builds up of rust showing on the pipework and heat exchangers and such like. Normally at this point, I'd have uh, two bottles of water, so I'd, uh, with brown and black water in there. Um, I've just recently had a new boiler put in, asked both of the plumbers, domestic plumbers, which is the worst one, brown or black. Both of them picked the black as the worst case. Actually, it's the brown because that shows that it's got active, active oxygen in the system. And one of the things that's going to kill a system quicker than anything else is active oxygen in a system. Uh, so that's the both iron oxide, but one's magnetite, uh, which is the black one. So that shows that there's no active oxygen in there. This one uh, slide shows rate of corrosion of different metals. Uh, so you've got aluminium, mild steel and copper. So the, the sweet spot on uh, for corrosion for all the three different types of metal is between six and a half and eight and a half as a pH balance. So the call it buffering. So the manufacturers of inhibitors try and keep the pH buffer to between six and a half and eight and a half. Bear with me a minute. Sorry about that. Um, mild steel and iron corrode rapidly in untreated systems or poorly treated systems. If you don't have enough treatment in a system, say you've got 80% of the chemical in that you should have, you're going to find that only part of the system is protected. The water has got so much corrosion uh, power and it'll uh, it'll attack the other 20% of the system that's not protected. Uh, so having an under uh, dose system is actually worse than having a non dose system. So making sure that your systems dose to the right percentage is it's very very important. We can't stress that enough. Obviously, bits of the corrosion lift and form on different metals and then you get corrosion cells forming in that point where you've got two disparate metals forming. Uh, Pinolin on radiators is a key one of that. Uh, with this one, iron oxide, it's, it always sits at the bottom of this system. Uh, so it'll uh, go in the pumps, it'll sit in the radiators. As you can see from the cold spot in the radiator, the heat's not transferring as efficiently as it was designed. Uh, so you're going to get cold areas in a room. You're not going to heat the rooms up correctly if the water quality isn't correct and it's allowed sludge to form and block radiators um, and such like. It's going to reduce water velocity as well. As we said, it builds up in the most part of a system, usually in the boiler. It forms a tough layer and you have to get every chem the chemicals in to actually lift it. Uh, a lot of people are using um, like magnetic type filters without using a chemical to lift anything. The magnetite's not going to lift on its own, so you need something in there to clean the system and start to disturb the uh, sediment that's settled at the bottom. Uh, as it dis disturbs it and starts mobilising it and putting it into solution, it'll float around the system and then filters are capable of removing it at that point. Um, there's different types, obviously, back filters and magnetic filters. The brown water, the magnetic filters won't take out because that hasn't turned to magnetite yet. The bag type filters will take any debris out that's floating around, depending on the size of it. Um, it's easy to block, block a system and obviously crack heat exchangers. If you get a heavy bake on, what's going to happen is the heat exchanger is trying to push heat through, 
but because you've got a build up on the outside of the exchanger, that's going to restrict it. So if you've got any uh, manufacturing faults in the uh, 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 metals, it can cra cause cracking. So. Aluminium. Uh, Aluminium is used in heat exchanges for very good reasons. Um, it can be forged. It's easy to uh, make the shapes that they need. It's lighter. The big one is it's dynamic. It's, sorry, it's uh, higher efficiency at, at transferring the heat than steel or stainless steel. So it actually transfers heat far better. Uh, so that makes aluminium heat exchanges um, more efficient and uh, cheaper to run. Um, it produces its own protective uh, oxide layer, uh, dependent on the pH. But once you go above a pH of 8.5, you will see that the uh, aluminium deteriorates quite rapidly. So you need to keep an eye on your pH levels. If you know that aluminium is in a system, maintaining a pH of below 8.5 is critical. Did somebody just buzz in, Joe? No, no. Oh, sorry, it's first time I've heard that noise. <laughs> it sounded, I didn't know if some, that was somebody raising a uh, hand or something. No. Uh, I've had this one recently where somebody's filled a system up uh, with uh, base exchange softened water. Um, what we found with that was it affected the uh, pH and that in turn then um, affected the aluminium. So we were, where the limit of aluminium should be less than one ppm, we actually saw 5.6 and above on the aluminium because base exchange water had been, had it, uh, been used to fill. Uh, so most of the manufacturers on the boilers will say not to use base exchange softened water to do the fill, use mains water. Uh, there's certain uh, inhibitors that are um, more old school that look after iron systems really well. So they'll push the uh, in, uh, pH values up to 10, 10 and a half. Um, and that's OK if you know 100% know that everything in the system is steel, iron. It's going to look after that system. The problem is if there's anything that's in there that's aluminium, you're going to get losses very quickly from the aluminium side and they can be very expensive to uh, repair. Stainless steel uh, generally tends to be highly stable. Uh, the only downside is if you've got uh, high chloride or high sulfite levels, you can get corrosion pitting. Um, and that's it is an aggressive way of um, attacking stainless steel. But it's one of the parameters we check on the commercial system check when we're looking at a system. Is there high chloride or sulfate le sulfate levels? And um, that could indicate that you could be getting corrosion um, on stainless. From a monitoring point of view, uh, I just mentioned uh, system check. This is a way of actually making sure that the water's balanced in a system and you've got the right uh, level of inhibitor in the system. So it monitors pH, alkalinity, TDS, um, and the levels of your metallic, so copper, iron, and uh, aluminium. So it makes sure that what you're doing is working and you ideally check it every year. So one of these system checks, on a system, ideally on the return, so that you're making sure that you're getting a good uh, water flow through. And you, uh, if you get everything through with a uh, green tick, you know you've got a system that's been managed properly and been looked after. Just back to what we started with, which was BG29. Um, their table for this is the levels so this is for cleaning a new system and what the level should be at and over point um, so iron less than 3 ppm has dissolved 6 ppm as total if you look down at the bottom with x100 we're capable of holding on to up to 125 ppm of iron so th they set a limit 
uh, but as a manufacturer, we, we've got faith in our inhibitor that it can hold on to far higher levels. But they do say refer to the water treatment manufacturer. So at that point, you can say, well, we're using Sentinel X100 and these are the levels we've been advised we can protect her. Uh, copper and aluminium, um, everybody gives the basically same recommendation, which is one ppm less than. Um, BS 7593 on domestic systems, basically uh, seek guidance from the water treatment manufacturer. You couldn't uh, monitoring options. So part of the new BG 29 is how do we know what's happening in a system? In the past, corrosion coupons uh, and present to be fair, corrosion coupons are a weighted piece of steel that have been measured by a lab. You insert them into the system on a rack so you know exactly what the weight is of the corrosion uh, coupon. You put them in, you've got them in for a set length of time, three months, six months, maybe a year, but generally three months to six months. Um, and then you remove the um, coupon, send it back to the lab, and they can assess what the rate of corrosion is during that time. The downside to that is you don't know if there's been peaks where you've had higher levels of corrosion because of an issue. You don't know when it's happened during that three month or six month period. So from that point of view, it tells you that you've got corrosion happening, but it can't give you an indication that you've had a top up of the system or that so there's been um, an event that's caused it. Multi-parameter monitoring, so it's a very complex system, so it's looking at pH, TDS, uh, a lot of other oxygen levels in, in the water. Um, what you tend to find is that's a very expensive system to put into um, uh, heating or uh, sorry, uh, heating or cooling system, uh, work out about 14 grand for the system plus up to £2,000 a year to actually run and interpret the results. So the, them sort of systems are available, but they're, they're not as cost effective. Water sampling, you can send the samples out, wait for the results to come back, but again, it's not going to tell you when you've had a problem in the system. Um, what Sentinel as uh, an organisation have worked on is a corrosion probe. So this is something that sits in the system and it monitors and gives you a timeline on events on the corrosion rate in the system of the water and also at what temperatures you're running. But we'll get onto that in a minute. Um, basically, it's uh, a much cheaper option and it's nice and straightforward. Uh, your engineer goes to site and pulls the data themselves and you get graphs out to show you what is happening in the system. So that's the approach that we're taking to the BG29 for monitoring moving forward. Oops, sorry. So as I said, uh, we've got the real-time corrosion monitoring system. Um, it sits um, in the pipe work and the picture on the right hand side, the, that's the data logger on the top. Um, it reduces um, your costs of sending uh, water samples off, waiting for them to come back. As I said, you can go plug it in and get the data straight away and it will save the data in the logger for the whenever you go back. It'll save it for up to 10 years. Um, and the information, the um, Sorry, lost lost it there. <laughs> the um, to be connected into the BMS uh, for a vault free contact, so it's got a set limit. So if it goes into alarm, it can be linked to the BMS so that people are notified within the building. As we said, uh, the Corrosion monitor is made up of three parts. You've got the XFIT connector that actually connects into the pipe work um, and you want the probe uh, that it shows there on the right hand side to sit at least 
10 mil into the water flow. So uh, no more than halfway through, but you want it to be in the water flow. You don't want it to get uh, dragged where it's on the linear flow too near to the pipe surface. So you want it well into the water flow. And then the uh, data logger is connected on the top. So what it's doing is it's recording the corrosion rate on the bottom of the coupon on the bottom of the probe. So it's reading how much loss is on the coupon over a period and sending that to the data logger. And as I said, you can pull the reports off in that, fun in that function. So this is how it would look. Uh, so you can see you get little spikes. As I said at the beginning, you, it's not about complete control of corrosion. It's about limiting the corrosion within a system. So it's, you, there's always going to be an underlying level of corrosion, no matter what you do. But with better quality inhibitors, you're going to limit that level that you're going to see. Uh, so the monitor's actually there. It's picking up the levels. And then when it gets to a pre preset and you can set the limit yourself, a preset limit of corrosion, it goes into alarm and it'll send a signal to the BMS. There's also an audible alarm on the unit as well, so it'll be heard in the plant room. Uh, but that can be done. You can see that that's over a period of time. Um, so it gives you data that you can look back at and say, right, we've had a problem then. What occurred? Did we drop the system? Was there a problem with an expansion vessel? And you can analyse the data to see if something caused that corrosion rate to spike. As I said, we, it's called event analysis. So it, the other systems, it's the coupons that are in the uh, system for three to six months, you can't see the timescale where you're going to get the corrosion rates. With, the, with our monitor, you can actually see when something goes wrong. So that gives you a better understanding then of trying to identify in this period what went wrong, what, what caused it, can we fix that, and making sure that you're not getting them issues reoccurring. So you can use it as a learning process for each system moving forward. Um, it comes set at uh, 24 micro siemens a year. Um, and if it goes above that, it will automatically trigger. As I said, there's a red light on the um, logo. It's also a, an audible alarm. And there's the, sorry? Uh, there's a remote signal uh, sent to the BMS. Uh, when the risk no longer exists, the alarm stops, but it's obviously recorded. And as I said, it can be recorded for up to 10 years. That's how we uh, see uh, planned maintenance for uh, a quality looked after system, checking the water, planning cleaning, select quality products, uh, verify products used, so buy a system check, uh, send the water analysis off, get the results back. You've got a digital, uh, you've got a paper proof then of the results. Uh, make sure your water treatment's covered. There's so many sites where the water's just running around for years and years and nobody's actually looking at the, what's actually in the water. And then it, when the system falls over, fingers get pointed at. Uh, test and monitor. The corrosion monitor is going to be one of them critical things where it tells you you've got a problem. So it's an early warning device on that basis. Sorry. How much it costs if you do have a fault? Uh, this was from um, a study that, that as a company we did. Material and labour to replace a 70 kilowatt uh, boiler about three and a half thousand pound. Initially, cost for chemicals would be about three hundred pound for the cleaning and inhibiting uh, using quality product. Uh, putting cheaper product in isn't always the best option long term. You've got a big investment in uh, the boiler. Look after it with the correct inhibitors. <clears throat> 
this one is a 500 kilowatt boiler. Um, if the design efficiency drops uh, by, it, it designed at 85% efficiency. If that drops by 10%, so it's only running at 75% efficiency, you're going to see a big increase in gas costs, and you're also going to see a big increase in the output of CO2. Uh, so keeping everybody aware of them sort of extra costs as a client can help you actually justify why you're going to use something that's going to do the job properly and going to give them a good clean system for years to come. This is a case study uh, that uh, one of our guys was involved in a few years ago. Um, the unit uh, boiler was commissioned in the autumn and the following spring it fell over. They had a problem. Uh, the boilers were about £250,000, so not insignificant. It was a high school. Um, we were asked to go and sit in and work out what had gone wrong uh, because it went it went legal. So what we, we did in the first instance was do a water analysis to look at what the actual water was in the system and then look at what was uh, used. Obviously, you can tell from that there's a large percentage on deposit analysis of aluminium. So it became clear that the, the aluminium meat exchanger had started to corrode and started floating around the system. Once we extracted the water, there were 20 ppm of uh, aluminium in the water. As I said, the limits on BG50 is 1 ppm. So it's 20 times worse than it should have been. Copper uh, levels was also high. That's because the aluminium and the copper will have been reacting. Uh, the dosing level conductivity, somebody had put something in the system. Uh, you can tell that because it's quite an high conductivity. The pH is 9.6. So whatever they put in had made the pH elevate, which caused then the aluminium to corrode which then had a knock-on effect and uh, caused the boiler to fail within six to seven months. So uh, we were asked to do uh, a comparison of how the water, how the chemical that was used uh, uh, stopped the pH from going out of what we call buffer, so going above the 8.5 mark. So to do that, you add uh, an alkalinity to the uh, diluted 1% treatment, and then you measure how much of the alkalinity you add to get it to 8.5 or just round about there. As you can see, the brand that was used, only 0.6 was required, whereas with ours X100, 8.0 was required to actually knock the pH up to about the 8.5 level. So it meant that the buffering capability to hold on to the pH at that six and a half to eight and a half, we, the X100 would have done a much better job and it had stopped the uh, water heater from the water from getting an increased pH up at 9.6 and it had stopped the aluminium from corroding and failing. Uh, we're quite unusual that we do have multiple cleaners within our range. Um, for our new system, so on an initial clean for BG29, uh, we'd be looking at the X300 because that lifts greases, oils, floats, insulation, all the stuff that's used on new boilers, new pipe work. So we're looking at lifting anything that's on there to protect them while they're sat in stores, in transit, and in the install process. Once the project is into the BG50 realm, so it's been running for over three months, and BG50 kicks in. Uh, you're looking at different issues, you're looking at magnetites, corrosion debris, limescale slimes, that sort of thing. So then at that point, we'd be looking at using X400 uh, as the cleaner to get the best effect. X100 is our patented inhibitor um it's widely known within the industry it, it it's one of them products it does what it says on the tin it looks after the system 
Um, it's got a longer life than a lot of the mixed type nitrite uh, mold date mix type inhibitors where they need topping up every year because the nitrite drops out. With ours, it is a mold of dirt. It does stay in the system. If you've got a nice tight system and you're not making up with fresh water on um, a regular basis, and on that, you shouldn't be topping up more than 5% of the system volume a year. Otherwise, you have got a problem. So that's a good one to look at. But with ours, the X100 should be able to stay in a system for four, five, six years if you don't have losses on the system. And it, so it's, you're not having to go back and spend the extra money every year topping it up. You go back, check it, make sure the levels are at the right levels. And then, you know, you're good to leave it for the next check in 12 months time. Total system volume uh, on a lot of the existing sites, we're not always told what the volumes are. So as a rule of thumb, we use 12 litres per kilowatt. So if you've got a 500 kilowatt boiler, you times that by 12, so that give you 6,000 litres, 1% of X100, so you need 60 litres of X100 at 1%. Uh, so it's a nice, easy way of working it out. This one is something that we tend to share more with water treatment companies when we're discussing it with them. Um, X100 is a complex chemistry. It's not the lower end of the market. This is designed as the Rolls Royce of inhibitors. So the, we're doing multiple things and looking after, like you see, low carbon steel stainless in a number of different ways. We're not just using one thing to look after it. We're looking at different ingredients to do different parts. So there's it's it's a real complex chemistry that we've got. And the reason it's lasted so long in the marketplace, as I said, it does what we say it does. And we'll, we'll always stand by it. What does that mean in the real world? Um, as we said earlier, well, I said earlier, sorry, um, Galvanic corrosion is a big one, so multiple metals in a system, you're always going to get more corrosion when you've got multiple metals. One of the tests that we do on um, the inhibitors is to see how they cope with a single steel coupon. Uh, so these next ones are thing, a test that were done in the lab. So this is on the left hand side, this is a control sample, so there's no treatment and the same water and steel coupon after 33 days at a constant temperature for the 33 days at 80 degrees centigrade and as you can see there's corrosion there with just no treatment in and just one steel coupon on its own so you've got flash corrosion on there and it's taking effect and over a longer period obviously there'd be more and more corrosion build up Same system, 33 days, 80 degrees centigrade, and X100 uh, dust at 1%. As you can see, compared to the original, no treatment, far better. The next ones are, these were all tested for five days, uh, the next five pictures. So these are five days at a constant 80. And these are own brand chemicals that are designed to stop corrosion. So this is what's happening in a, potentially happening in the system with other types of chemical inhibitor. Um, one of the things at Sentinel that we work very closely with is obviously other manufacturers making sure that we're supporting them in the marketplace. So people like Amworthy will use uh, the system checks and make sure that when they've done an install, they get a system check back so that they're happy with the water chemistry. Everybody's warranties are going out further and further. Everybody's putting longer warranties on to, as a sales aid um, to prove that their products are quality product. Uh, seven years, 10 years on a lot of products nowadays. Always make sure that it's a multi-metal system, it's a multi-product um, system, so you've got the pipe work, you've got the pumps, you've got the boilers, you've got multiple things in there that all have 
a corrosion factor that's going to be affected. So we work with these people. We've got um, approvals from all these to say our X range works effectively and they're happy. FX range chemicals are in X100, X300 to clean, X400 to clean. Uh, they're happy that the contract has done the best job that they can. Okay. My first run through of that, so I apologise if it's quicker or longer than anybody thought. Uh, has anybody got any questions? And thank you so much for your time.